Poor old Time Tees. In many ways, it could be considered a major ITV station. It's been on the air since 1959, a little over three years into the channel's existence. Only Granada has lasted longer. It never lost its franchise, and it served the northeast of England faithfully for almost all of ITV's 60 years. And yet everyone seems to forget that it exists. Tighties is one of the most hard done by of all ITV stations. In particular, spending the entire quarter century and counting since the Broadcasting Act has seemingly the entire ITV network's bitch. It deserved better, and this is why. The North East was one of the last places in England to get any TV transmitter in the first place, let alone ITV. With the original four ITV companies hitting their first period of genuine struggle in 1957, expansion was on the ITA's agenda, and they commissioned a brand new transmitter in Burnhope, County Durham, the posh end of the region, naturally. With that successfully set up, they invited anyone with the money and wherewithal, because in those days you needed both, to bid for a TV service to run on it. The winner was a consortium led by Sir Richard Pease, and in a startling contrast to the modern model, won the franchise for a strong commitment to local regional programming of quality. All they needed now was a name. They had bid under the appellation North East England. Fairly simple and obvious, but for some reason the ITA felt that was too vague. So they started thinking about local landmarks, and in particular, rivers, because the northeast of England has three rather good ones in the Tyne, the Weir, and the Tees. But Three Rivers Television was similarly rejected for being too oblique, and the grimly utilitarian Tyne, Weir, and Tees Television was considered too long and unwieldy. Also, its initials spelled twat. Finally, with just two months to spare, the name Tyne, Tees Television was announced. Bad luck for the weir. The station launched on the 15th of January 1959 with a heavily nautical theme. Tyne Tees Television, Channel 8. That announcement at the start wasn't special or unique, incidentally. It was part of the ident, which must be nearly unique in itself. The tune came from along about the middle eight of the Tyne Tees theme tune the Three Rivers Fantasy, finally giving the weir its due. The fantasy was heard at the start of every day and consisted of the materials of every folk tune you could imagine with a northeastern and or nautical theme, including When the Boat Comes In and, of course, the national anthem, The Bladen Races, combined with the kind of orchestrals you might associate with a Hayes Code era Hollywood film. few years of Tide Tees were somewhat difficult, as they were for ITV on the whole. Five years into the channel's existence, the government set up the Pilkington Commission to effectively take the pulse of British broadcasting. The resulting report came out two years later and was highly critical of the entire ITV network for its lack of intellectual fibre. And singled out for particular criticism was Tyne Tees for its unfortunate habit of skipping the more niche network programming and replacing it with endless imports of gun smoke and the like. In other quarters, however, Tyne Tees were praised for being one of the first stations to allow regional accents to be heard on the telly box, albeit inevitably subordinate to the standard BBC Aye, English. Well, isn't this government in the Glimmish and getting on everybody's nerves? <laughs> I'm getting a bit steak for his tea. Burn the night burns, lass, you cannot see it. That wasn't enough to prevent the government from using the Pilkington Report as an excuse to impose a levy on ITV. In other words, a shiny new tax. And with expert timing, a recession happened right after it took effect, putting the entire network up the creek. Among the companies that faced collapse was, you guessed it, Tyne Tees. 
To save them from total financial ruin, Tynties merged in a quasi-shotgun marriage with Yorkshire Television, with whom they'd been embroiled in an ongoing row over the ownership of the Blitzdale transmitter, so two birds were killed with one stone. As discussed in the Yorkshire episode, this was Trident Television. Initially set up as a mere holding company for the purposes of selling airtime on behalf of two stations at once, by 1974 it was a full-blown merger. But let's backtrack a bit. Colour arrived in the North East in 1969, and with it came a new ident and a new logo, one which would come to be indelibly associated with the station and the region for the rest of its existence. The music's a little on the unnecessary side. You're introducing Coronation Street, not declaring war. But the logo is terrific. Simultaneously playful and serious, it seems constantly in motion, or driving lines, and even an arrow formed out of the V. I became briefly obsessed with this thing at the age of five when I spent a Christmas in North Allerton, back when just being in a different part of the country was like being abroad, only better because no foreign languages. At the time, I couldn't really figure out what it was supposed to be, because I was dumb but it reminded me of a drunk British Rail logo. Or a sober British Rail logo, maybe. What was lost was the nautical scene, although of course the Three Rivers fantasy remained and would do so until Startup was scrapped somewhere in the mid-80s. And I suppose the right-hand side of the logo looks a bit like an anchor, but they never draw attention to it. Without that theme, you could argue that the sense of the logo expressing a specific regional identity was lost too. And perhaps that was true at first, but ultimately the logo was strong enough as a design that it came to sum up the North East on its own, without needing any inherent visual cues in its design. In effect, it became its own icon. It was the same process I described in the Wales episode with reference to the HTV aerial, Assuming you didn't skip that bit, or fall asleep. The logo was complemented by some of the friendliest continuity on the ITV network, exemplified by the great Colin Weston, who brought his family friend who lives inside the television style from the 70s intermittently through to the 90s. Granada, against all reason, common sense, and the will of God Almighty, had failed to renew his initial contract in 1970, so he spent the next few years freelancing. Tynetees was a favoured port of call, and his performances here won him a new Granada contract, although fortunately for viewers elsewhere, not an exclusive one, and he kept appearing on Tynetees and other stations pretty much until the end of Envision continuity forced him into retirement. Other favourites include the cognac-voiced Neville Wanless, who on occasion actually managed to out-nice Colin Weston. Being closed down by Wanless was like being tucked up in bed by a gigantic teddy bear, only in a good and non-terrifying way. Well, Bill and Judy will be looking after you this weekend, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again on Tuesday. But from me, Neville Wanderers, on behalf of everyone here at Tyne Tees, it's uh, good night once again, God bless, sleep well, and if you're on your own right now, I'd like to wish you a very special good night. Have a very nice weekend, and I'll see you Tuesday. Bye-bye now. Lady type announcers included the late Annie St. John, in a brief defection from HTV, and the headmistress like Judy Lines. On Tyne Tees this afternoon is three feature films, including uh, drama... Presiding over them all, like the Odin of Tyneside, was the legendary oak-voiced Mike Neville. Voice of the North East on ITV and the BBC for over 40 years. Joining Tyne in 1962, and finally retiring in 2006, long after its identity had been subsumed. Admittedly, 32 of the intervening years were spent at the BBC on Look North, and occasionally nationwide, but let's not ruin the narrative with facts. He was and is a local TV legend. And what's more, there was no one better at holding a show together when things inevitably went wrong. Diane Nelms, no, have you got the film yet? 
It's been one of those funny days. Must have been the royal visit, I think, yeah. Bear with us a moment. These things do. Radio Newcastle had similar problems this morning, you know. They couldn't get pictures. <laughs> Nothing could be. <laughs> Let us know when you're ready. Right, here we go. Under Trident, Time T stabilised. And once out of financial dire straits and able to make local programming again, became a respected regional broadcaster. But as the 70s wore on, the fact that one company owned two franchises started to wrangle with what was now known as the IBA. Imagine that. It didn't help that Trident would occasionally bring up the possibility of renaming the stations. Trident Yorkshire and Trident Time Tees. The IBA inevitably told them to knock it off after a while, but Trident kept right on sitting there, absently juggling its two franchises like the ghost of ITV future. Finally, the IBA got sick and tired of them altogether. In the late 70s, ITV's business was by and large booming, unlike the rest of the country. Well, apart from the 12 weeks when the entire network was brought to a complete screeching halt by monumental industrial action, and even that only disrupted its momentum for a further few months. Certainly it was healthy enough that the whole point of Trident's existence had now been completely negated. And so when the next franchise review arrived in 1980, the IBA instituted a new and sadly short-lived rule that one company could only own up to one and a third's worth of a franchisee. Trident took the hint. They divested themselves of Yorkshire and Time Tees in stages and eventually left the television business altogether, moving into betting shops and casinos instead, where they were swiftly and efficiently eaten alive. As a footnote, one of the last things Trident had invested in before the demerger was a burgeoning pan-European satellite television broadcaster, which was later sold to a Mr. R. Murdoch for one, one, quid. He proceeded to relaunch the station under the new name, of Sky Channel. And now you know the rest of the story. Oh, what tangled webs we weave when first we practice free market capitalism. Anyway, Time Tees and Yorkshire were now separate entities again, self owned and self directing. Forced steam merger aside, they got through the 1980 franchise round with very little trouble having the previous year introduced an ident somewhat ahead of its time. It might not look like much now, but this was an age when idents tended to zoom in or otherwise form up from a two-dimensional plane. While not truly 3D, this does at least acknowledge the existence of a third dimension, and fully three years before Channel 4 came along and changed the game altogether, as I seem to mention at roughly this point every episode. So this ident, backed by the likes of Western Wanless and Lines on drums and lead guitar, served the region for almost a decade, until the year of the second summer of love. By which I mean 1988, not 1989. The first second summer of love. There were two second summers of love. Everyone was on ecstasy, go figure. Anyway, 1988 saw a change in ident and a change in tech. Computer graphics have arrived. Of course, everyone else was using the technology in blatant imitation of Channel 4, flinging chunks of CGI all over the shop. Time Tees used it differently, creating a demure, muted piece that at first glance looked hand-animated rather than computer-generated. This is the one I remember from my visit to North Allerton that Christmas. The polite and non-threatening aesthetic, coupled with the likeable but whisper-thin musical accompaniment, obviously left quite an impression on a child more used to the brass band fanfare of TSW the haunting synth chords of Jeff Wayne on TVAM, and of course the apocalyptic Siren of Doom on Channel 4. It marked Time Tees out as different, gentle and assuming, not here to take over the world, just here to serve the local area, 
if that's all right with you. It was really quite refreshing, not to mention the most relaxing eye dent I'd ever seen. Shame about the timing. Despite only having just introduced a new eye dent that probably hadn't been cheap, when ITV went generic, Tintees offered absolutely no resistance whatsoever in what would become a depressing pattern. As you can see, it doesn't really work. The question of how to properly integrate the TTTV logo into the triangle was given the incorrect answer of who cares. The logo is so small and so painfully cropped, there's no way to tell at a glance which of the two colours is the background and which the foreground, leading to widespread bafflement as people tried to pick out the familiar shape of the logo in the yellow bits, their perception having made the wrong call with regards to the Rubin vase effect. Tyne D stuck with this for a couple of years, which was more or less average. By 1991, with the experiment more or less abandoned by ITV, and in readiness for the forthcoming franchise round, they reinstated their own logo. Although they kept the Dundas jingle, because hey. Later on, they brightened it up which actually made it a bit less impressive. Underlit always beats overlit, guys. Of course, that franchise round would end up being kind to almost no one except Carlton and Granada. And Tintees were no exception. They were relatively untroubled in the auction itself. Their sole rival turned out to be a consortium that included a few tendrils of Granada and, of all people, Border. Tintees beat them out easily. In fact, they panicked and overreacted, sending out a bid that turned out to be almost three times the size of their rivals, and much higher than the new regulator's ITC actually valued the franchise. In contrast, the biggest station in the network, Central, won their license back unopposed for an extraordinarily measly two grand. Despite this, Tintees were ultimately re-awarded the franchise, ridiculous annual fee and all. In a similar situation were their neighbours and former partners Yorkshire, who bid £37.7 million for a franchise they could have won for a little over half that. Between them, they were now subject to fees of just shy of £53 million a year, or around $80 million, just to keep broadcasting. The obvious course of action was to join forces once more. With the Broadcasting Act 1990, it was now perfectly acceptable for one company to run two franchises, and two extant franchisees merging together meant they could get a head start on any outside takeovers, which weren't allowed until 1994. So Yorkshire Time Tees happened, and just in case you weren't sure what Time Tees' place in the new setup would be, here's that logo again. To celebrate this alliance between Fox and Hen House, Tyne T's got a new ident and a new logo, replacing the old British rail looking thing after two decades. To be fair, it is quite clearly based on the old logo, and by based on, I mean de stylized from. The only slightly oblique modernist lines became explicitly four block letters in an unattractive tubby font. I'm visiting their intentions a bit here, but this seems to be a deliberate attempt to make their logo clearer. And I've admitted that when I encountered it in 1988, I had no idea what it was. I was five, and mildly dyspraxic. Now, I'm not saying that YTT were worried that their viewers weren't any smarter than your average mildly dyspraxic five-year-old, but the facts are in front of us. We've gone from Piet Mondrian to Mavis Deacon. De style to no style. Neoplasticism to moulded plastic. Or at least a computer simulation thereof. At least the animation still pays tribute to the original logo's construction. Interesting choice of jingle as well. A Yanni track played three times normal speed. Mm. 
worse was to come, however. In 1995, YTT got a new chief executive. In the shape of former TVAN despot, Bruce Welcome to Television, Gingell. His big idea, as detailed in the Yorkshire episode, was to rebrand both stations, and ultimately ITV, and presumably ultimately the entire world, as Channel 3. Channel 3 Yorkshire, and Channel 3 North East. Yorkshire, of course, were big enough, well enough recognised, and enough of a player, that their board could turn such a stupid idea down flat. Time Tees had less of a reputation. They were no TSW, they made some network programming, generally extremely light entertainment. And when I say light entertainment, I mean the almost weightless likes of daytime game shows, crosswits and chain letters. They also made some quality kids programmes like Supergram, which you would think came from Scotland, but didn't. Hang about, look out for Supergram. Arguably their most notable show of all wasn't even made for ITV, but for Channel 4. The epochal music show The Tube, named for the entrance to their studios. And that was long dead by 1995. By the time of Bruce Gingell's arrival, Time Tees were mostly known for the old Catherine Cookson adaptation, and of course their local programming, which post-broadcasting act meant next to nothing. So, once again, the North East was reduced to the bitch region. A little white mouse in a maze being overseen by mad scientist Bruce Gingell. Over the deafening objections of common sense, Channel 3 North East was launched in 1996 with a decent, if relatively by the numbers, promo and an ident which... We'll take a look. Problematic. In all technical respects, it's fine. As part of a showreel, it would be promising. It's well put together. But the actual design is perfunctory at best. Rumour has it that it was put together in a couple of afternoons, and you can believe it. Nothing about it stands out. It's pure, generic television. The sort of thing you might have seen in the background of a movie set in the future. I wouldn't buy that for a dollar, but I think Bruce and company did. The giant Helvetica 3 really sums the design up in its all-encompassing blandness. It could be a logo for a brand of washing powder for all intents and purposes. And then at the end of it, what's the station called? Channel 3 Northeast? Northeast 3? Okay, that's forgivable as stylization on the part of the designer, but the sheer number of people who insist on calling this movie Sesevenen demonstrates that you need to take care with this sort of thing. Now hang on a second, it still says Time Tees Television at the bottom. If your ident can't even clearly express your channel's name, you need to go back to the drawing board before you put that mess on screen. The announcers also kept calling it Time Tees, whether out of confusion, habit, or even defiance. To make the confusion complete, take a look at the production caption. What does that even mean? The final touch is the music. Which again isn't inherently bad in itself, but it's bland and it doesn't really fit. Which isn't a surprise, since this is a generic library piece they've grabbed off the shelf almost at random. A bit like the animation and logo itself. The Channel 3 experiment went down like a knee in a sandwich, and Gingell eventually buggered off back to Australia to support John Howard, and eventually die of an inevitable heart attack three years later. YTT was sold to Granada who immediately took the Channel 3 branding and hurled it into the bin where it belonged. The replacement ident wasn't very good, but it was a blessed relief just to see TTTV again.
pretty perfunctory, really. They even kept the off-the-shelf music, as if to demonstrate just how much they cared about the station and its region. But of course by then, Granada were planning the second ITB generic look, and they certainly didn't want to spend too much time and energy on a station that nobody really cared about anyway. Well, except the people who watched it, but what could they bring to the table? The Hearts Idents weren't kind to Time Tees, reducing their logo to four pixel-sized letters in the middle of the screen. But soft, this is not yet the end. Just as with their big brothers Yorkshire, Time Tees managed to get away with one extra ident, the best since the flowing rivers. Like its Yorkshire equivalent, this was a special local programming ident for use before North Easter Night and the like. It even incorporated a new arrangement of the logo. This circle flanked version was naturally seen interchangeably with the post channel 3 typeface in defiance of basic marketing and common sense, but it barely mattered at this point. The local ident was already an anachronism as regional ITV began its slow march into history. The full stop came in 2010, long after regional ITV ceased to exist in England, when the long abandoned City Road Studios were finally demolished. Of course, like all of them, Tyne T still technically exists, but in its way it's one of the most successful ITV stations of all. It weathered bad times, but it was there from just after the beginning, and it never lost its franchise. It would be unforgivably corny to use the words local hero at this point, although accurate. But that's not going to stop me using the music. I'm not laughing, I can't sleep for debt. I'm up to there. I wish I was a bit taller. <laughs> <laughs>